Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name's Aidan Ziegler, and I'm going to be talking about the Cloud Development Kit for Terraform, or CDKTF. And we're going to be looking at some patterns that it enables for providing security by default to our applications, really bridging the gap between security enforcement and developer enablement. We will be touching on the basics of CDKTF, the organizational changes we normally see in scale, we normally see scale up projects go through. And then finally, how CDKTF can enable those organizational changes. So first, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a lead consultant at Cognizant Servian here in Perth, Western Australia. And my day typically consists of helping large enterprises digitally transform to become truly cloud native organizations. And one of the tools we often use for this is Terraform to codify infrastructure configurations. So Terraform uh, is a well-known infrastructure as code tool that allows us to codify our infrastructure for repeatable and rapid deployments. CDKTF is a layer that sits over the top of Terraform that allows you to use a programming language of your choice to interact with your infrastructure. So here we can see that TypeScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, and Go can all be used with the CDK, meaning that if your developers already have proficiency in this language, there's no new domain-specific language that they need to learn. Instead, they can interact with Terraform without touching HashiCorp configuration language at all. And by using Terraform under the hood, this means that users of CDKTF still have access to the wide range of providers supported by Terraform. So to understand how CDKTF works, we must first define a few core concepts, namely the building blocks that CDKTF infrastructure configurations are built out of. First up, we have stacks. And if you're coming from uh, stock Terraform land, this can be thought of as encompassing the totality of your Terraform project. A stack might consist of things like databases, VMs, containers, serverless functions, all the infrastructure required to deploy our application. And like our Terraform files, we can deploy stacks with different inputs to deploy multiple versions of our application, such as a dev, test, staging, and prod environment. Then zooming in a little bit within the stack, we have constructs. And these can be thought of as analogous to Terraform modules. They define groups of resources and other constructs that are used in a regular pattern throughout the application. For example, a construct might encompass a container, its associated load balancer, and a database for a microservice style pattern. A key difference with constructs though, is that you have all the development tools of your programming language of choice right at your fingertips, meaning you get things like nice IDE integrations through things like IntelliSense and strong typing. Finally, at the lowest level, we have resources, and these are the smallest possible unit of infrastructure that can be deployed. This might describe like a single Lambda function or an individual IAM policy. Fundamentally, everything else is just niceties to organize resources efficiently. And just to reiterate, all of this is backed by Terraform itself, meaning that the underlying resources that you can use to build your infrastructure are uh, just as wide as the number of resources available on the Terraform registry. So having used Terraform and CDKTF across consulting engagements, I thought I'd combine some of the patterns I use and lessons I've learned into the scale up journey of a fictional client to bring you along for that journey from both an organizational change perspective and a technical perspective. So the fictitious startup that we'll be helping to scale today is called Secure Roo. They're a later stage startup that's ready to grow and they have some pretty common requirements. Firstly, they need to make sure that the way they're storing their customer data is secure. The trust in the security of their company is a large part of their brand. They need to add more teams so they can deliver features faster for their customers and to provide upkeep for a growing code base. Being a startup at heart, they are very price conscious and hence have decided to leverage serverless technologies on AWS, such as Lambda and DynamoDB, that will allow them to scale with their user base. Finally, they've been using CDKTF to manage their infrastructure. So now we know a little more about how the company operates, let's dive into what their current team setup looks like. So Secure Brew currently has two development teams that produce artifacts, in this case, pull requests, that the security team reviews and then approves or request changes on and then eventually approves it to go out to production. Features are flowing, our security team is keeping our end users safe. Life is good, right? 
But now we're at the point where we need to accelerate. We want to deliver faster, and hence we need to scale our model. And typically what we see happening in this area is that companies often try and take the same model and just make it bigger, right? And that typically ends up looking like this. We've gone on a massive hiring spree and managed to triple our development capability. Excellent. Now we can create PRs faster than ever before. Our security team, though, has only managed to double at the same time. Finding security-focused engineers with experience in our stack and bringing them up to speed on the peculiarities of our code base and security models in use has taken longer than expected. And now the PRs are really starting to pile up, meaning that our security team is playing reactive catch-up rather than doing proactive security work. So obviously we're now at a point where both the developers and the security teams are getting frustrated. A threefold increase in our labor costs has produced marginal gains in productivity and morale is generally low. So what can we do about it? As the company grows, it becomes clear that to drive the kind of productivity increase that we are looking for, we need a new model. And this is where the shift left mentality comes into play. Our security team provides enablement to our development teams, and each individual team is responsible for the security of the artifacts it produces. So no longer are security the gatekeepers of production, but they assist teams with producing code that is production ready straight off the bat. To help with this, each team has nominated a security champion to keep eyes and ears out for any features or work that might require the involvement of the security team. So we've shifted from a model where security is enforced to the, by the security team to a model where security is enabled by the security team. And so remember that Secure Roo is using serverless technologies, right? So normally the first thing that someone suggests at this point is let's build a Lambda construct so our developers can securely provision their own Lambdas. Everyone's excited to start enabling their development teams. And typically what happens is they go out and they look at all the ways throughout the business that Lambda is being used and configured. And then after some really strong cups of coffee and coding, uh, you get a Lambda construct that covers every use case for your business. The security team is super excited to show the dev team their work and go, here's your new Lambda construct, let's get to work. And then they hand the development team the construct equivalent of this. It's configurable up to the highest degree, but it's complicated to use and it's not really clear how to get started. Now, luckily the security team has already thought of this. So here's 10,000 pages of Confluence documentation that we promise will definitely be kept up to date and not fall into disrepair at the six month mark at all. Now, remembering our goal was to empower developers with the tools required to enable them to take security of the artifacts that they produce into their own hands. Now we have to ask the question, can we trust our developers with this? Looking back at the interface, it looks like something you need to log 5,000 simulator hours in to be licensed to operate it, right? So going back to the original question I posed before, the developers aren't really the problem. I don't think you could realistically trust anyone outside of the security team with this. All we've really done is required that the users of our construct now need to be almost as knowledgeable as the people who wrote the construct. And once again, we fall into the trap of slowing down productive effort and having high engagement of the security team in producing secure artifacts, which leads us to two core problems. The first problem is that no one likes using our construct. It's complex, unwieldy, and the documentation has already gone out of date. And if no one is using our construct, how can we be sure they're producing secure artifacts to be deployed to prod? Luckily, there are some developers adopting the new paradigm and using the construct, and that leads us to our second problem. Our second problem is that the consumers of the construct are requiring lots of input from the security team to configure and deploy the construct in a meaningful way, resulting in our security team acting as an escalation point for developers more than they get to do actual security work. So instead of hitting 99% of all use cases, let's take the most common pattern of lambdas and create a minimal set of constructs that covers 85 to 95% of our use cases. This will result in a much simpler construct interface for the developers used to use, essentially giving them a big green button to hit to say, yes, I want to be secure. Given all of this is written in an actual programming language now, rather than a DSL, we can use all the features of that language to assist developers. So rather than a confluence page, we can have living documentation alongside our constructs through doc strings to provide explanations of how to use the construct straight in the IDE. And in order to reach this point, the crux of this approach is that all the extra pieces of configuration that we provided developers with originally have now been replaced with sensible defaults that cover most use cases and ensure that the average lambda in the company is secure. Constructs should be opinionated. That's a, a core 
core point to drive home there. Uh, but for those edge cases where the lander doesn't necessarily fit the mold of the average use case, then provide developers with an escape hatch that they can use to access greater levels of customization. And that's where you can present the user with this interface, because now you've accelerated the development of the broad use case. As the security team, you now also have the time to spend assisting the developer with their particular edge case that requires this interface. And so now our split looks a little bit more like this. The time spent helping developers is on more impactful work as it's working on the edge cases with niche security requirements. And a lot of time has been freed up to work on actual security related tasks, like providing more security accelerators to our development team. So now Secure Roos operating under the new paradigm, we've got the effects of the new team structure. Everyone's excited by this new model. Developers can ship their code much faster and security is championed from within each team, reducing burden on the dedicated security team. A smaller security team can now support a much larger development team and the developers are using the artifacts that our security team is producing to accelerate the development process. Looking back at our new team structure, our security team is happily producing artifacts and being, they're being consumed by developers who are happy that all the security roadblocks are being taken care of through the use of easy to use secure artifacts. And so our security team might be feeling a little bit like Santa Claus on Christmas day, distributing gifts of secure artifacts to all the developers in the company. But what's the next stage of this process? We've shifted left our security paradigm that enables developers to produce secure artifacts themselves. But at the end of the day, the core responsibility still lies with the security team to ensure that the application is secure. So although they may feel like Santa at the moment, they still have, a, have another job. And that is to enforce security across the estate. Parking back to our original team structure, this is the principle that the security team operated in the first place, all enforcement, no enablement. And we quickly saw how our security team became overwhelmed. So that brings us to a new question. How do we effectively measure and enforce this without introducing the same constraints that our system suffered from in the first place? And that's where some of the cool features in CDKTF come into play. We could use other HashiCorp tools like Sentinel to the same effect, but once again, our company has strong development experience in actual programming language and may not be up for learning a new domain specific language just for policies. Luckily, CDKTF has a solution for this already. And so the concept I'd like to introduce uh, you to is CDK in CDKTF is aspects. And whilst they have great uses outside of security, they enable us to provide some pretty powerful code first utilities uh, to our infrastructure deployment process. And hence, I like to think of aspects as a little bit of CDKTF security superpower. And first we need to understand what CDKTF aspects do. Under the hood, CDKTF and at a later point Terraform produce a graph of infrastructure nodes, highlighting dependencies between our various infrastructure components. Once this graph is generated, aspects registered in our stack will visit each node in the graph and perform some user-defined action. At its core, this seems like a very simple concept, but it enables some extremely powerful patterns. Just as a quick example, here's the infrastructure graph for a very simple CDKTF stack that contains a Lambda function, a Lambda layer, and an IAM role. We can see that both the IAM role and the Lambda layer depend on the root of the AWS provider. Then the Lambda function in turn depends on both the layer and the IAM role. And finally, we have the closure of the provider depending on the Lambda function. If we define an aspect in this stack, it would visit each of these nodes and perform whatever action that we coded it to do. So there are three main patterns that we're gonna to explore today uh, through the use of aspects in CDKTF. They are guardrails, enablement, and code level abstraction. And now we've seen how development CDKTF and Constructs can shift left the ownership of secure code production, we're now going to look at more, a more platform engineering based approach. This approach aims alongside shifting security left to push security down into the platform that developers use. And yeah, these are the three patterns we're gonna look at. So to start with, let's take a look at guardrails. This pattern sets the boundaries of what a developer can do on the platform. In this scenario, we wanna make sure that if a user defines a CloudFront distribution, that they are also assigning a web application firewall to that distribution. What this looks like in code is that we have a class called CloudFront WAF aspect that implements the I aspect interface. We override the function visit, and this is the function that takes the current node of the infrastructure graph that is being examined 
as an argument and will be called on every node of the graph. The first thing we do is we check if the node itself is a cloud front distribution. You will see these predicates a lot when using aspects, as usually we only want to operate on nodes with specific properties. Now, if the node is a cloud front distribution and does not have a web ACL ID input, we'll use the CDK annotation API to add an error to the infrastructure generation, saying that the CDN requires a configured WAF. And this will stop the process from proceeding to deployment. We've pushed enforcements of our standards now down to the platform layer. And the annotations API is powerful, as it will show you all the errors encountered on a run, rather than, say, using a throw statement that would just exit on the first error. And also, now because we're using a full programming language here, we can also program any action that is possible in TypeScript in this example. Um, so for example, you might want to open a ticket for the guardrail activation. So a security team member can proactively follow up with the developer when this guardrail is activated. So this pattern essentially allows us to put up a big roadblock whenever developers don't do what they're supposed to do and forces them to go back and fix it uh, before the infrastructure will deploy correctly. And as a security team, this might sound very tempting, but at the end of the day, we want to examine what the desired outcome is. Do we want to ensure that all developers that make a mistake are taken out of their flow state and forced to rectify security issues? Or are we more concerned that the CDN that they're deploying has a WAF in front of it? I suspect in most cases that it's the latter. And so that brings us to the enablement approach. Many of the structural components look the same. We still implement iAspect and override the visit function, except this time we're doing some more processing and have a constructor function. So what's that all about? In our constructor, we take a reference to a default WAF ARN that might be separately provisioned by the security team. And then when we visit our CloudFront distribution nodes and it doesn't have a web ACL input specified, then we add an informative annotation, letting the developer know that, hey, you forgot to add a WAF. And instead, we add our default WAF to the node. Of course, we might still use language specific features to log a ticket with security and make sure that the default WAF is adequate. Um, but this keeps the process moving for most cases. And this takes us back to that simply user experience we're chasing when building constructs. Now the process for deploying an insecure CloudFront distribution will result in a secure CloudFront distribution and maybe some help from the security team to make sure you're all good with the default WAF. Now, we might also want to put an enforcement in here to make sure that users are only configuring secure WAFs. So alongside our default WAF configura configuration aspect, we might have an enforcement on all WAFs created by the developers to make sure that they meet some minimum standards we set. So in this WAF minimum standards aspect, we are checking if our node is of type WAF Web ACL and checking if the rules are valid using some arbitrary logic, logic outside of the scope of this aspect. And then if they're not valid, we add an error and we point the user to where they can find more information. And here's a good place to link out to some internal documentation around what constitutes a secure WAF, be that a readme, confluence documentation, wherever you so wish to store it. And so now we've got these two patterns, people often seem to use them interchangeably. However, that's not really the best way to utilize these patterns. Ideally, we want our enablements to ensure a minimum baseline of security and still follow the commander's intent of what the developer is tr trying to achieve uh, in this. Uh, as, and these are the 90, 85 to 95% of use case scenarios. Enforcements, however, should be used to set the absolute boundaries of what a develop developer can do like with the min, uh, minimum WAF standards example. So going back to secure Roo, let's recap our outcomes so far. We have a library of artifacts that support sensible defaults and enforcements for those edge cases. Developers want to actually use our tooling because it's easy to include and it's actually making their life easier. And finally, the cognitive load on both the developers and the security team has decreased as we push that cognitive load down into our platform. Hooray, our infrastructure secure. But how far can we push the platform side of this? Wouldn't it be great if we could do the same thing we're doing with our developer's infrastructure with our developer's code? And that brings us to our third pattern, which is code level automation with aspects. Now, I'm not saying this is production ready or that you should go and implement this tomorrow. This is more of just an example of exactly how powerful aspects can be at defining platform level abstractions. And so the obligatory warning for this section is here be dragons. Some people like this approach. Others have described it as completely cursed. But let's dive into how it works. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the company New Relic, but I came across an interesting CLI tool that they had built. 
Basically, you pointed it at your Node.js Lambda functions, and with zero code changes to your deployed functions, it would then instrument them to hook into New Relic's observability platform. And at the time, this seemed like absolute magic to me. So of course, I had to dig a little deeper and find out exactly what was going on under the hood. So to explain what was going on, let's look at a traditional Lambda function. We have some event source, in this case, an API gateway, which calls our handler in our Lambda code which might then make some calls down into a library that lives in a Lambda layer. And then we call some downstream data storage service such as DynamoDB, propagate all the way back up to our event source to return the response and happy days. But did you know there's another place you can call your handler? What you can do is you can actually point the Lambda function handler parameter at code that lives in your Lambda layer, then use your Lambda layer to call user-defined code, which will then make its downstream calls. So the key takeaways from this is that our handler can actually live inside a Lambda layer. And a Lambda layer is just infrastructure, right? And functions are infrastructure as well. Therefore, all of this can be modified and enforced by CDK aspects. So here's a slightly more complicated aspect implementation. We have a constructor for our aspect that takes an ARN to our instrumentation layer as an input. And then if the node we visit is a Lambda function, we take a copy of the user-supplied environment variables, the user-supplied handler, and user supplied layers. We then modify the node handler to point to our Lambda layer. We extend the node layers to include our instrumentation handler uh, from our constructor. And then we pass in the user's original handler as the new environment variable. Then within our actual Lambda code, we might have a Lambda, fun uh, a Lambda handler that looks something like this, a patcher that wraps our user supplied handler function with a function from the Lambda layer. In this case, we're wrapping an API key check around our user-defined handler. So now we've implemented this pattern and injected security into an unsecured Lambda function, all using aspects. Our users need to be aware of the auth mechanism being injected, but their code can be agnostic. Forgetting a decorator or a function call isn't going to break your authentication because it's handled at the platform level. And all of this doesn't need to just be limited to security. Patterns that you want to inject over your entire Lambda cloud estate can also be injected here, like application performance monitoring, request logging, audit trails, secrets management, the list goes on. And the last question I normally get in this is, well, why do this when we have a construct? And now constructs are great for giving developers the tools they need to build securely, but operating at the resource level with aspects gives developers the opportunity to make their own construct and instead inverts the maintenance dependency on the security team, allowing for the security team to make better use of their time. So to finish off, let's come back to secure Roo. Under this new paradigm of both development and platform-driven enablement, developers can really focus on writing the code that drives business value. Our developers need to be security conscious and understand the mechanisms at play, but they do not need to be security experts like our security team. And finally, our security team can both enable the development team and enforce control through guardrails. Everyone's happy, and we're now at the point where delivery has scaled up as expected, and we haven't had to sacrifice any security to get here. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. If you're interested in any of the content from this talk or want to connect, feel free to catch me on LinkedIn, which is that first QR code. For the code associated with the talk, you can head to my GitHub on the middle QR. Or for more information on the self-instrumenting Lambda functions, uh, you can check out a blog post I made about it on the last QR code. Hopefully, you've all enjoyed this talk as much as I have uh, enjoyed presenting it. And thanks to HashiCorp for having me. Enjoy the rest of the conference and see you all.